so this is intended to be a talk that sort of combines um, uh, an indie approach to Agile and uh, some ideas about how to kind of adapt it even further to uh, support remote development for small teams. Um, and this is, this is based on my own thesis project many years ago. This is based on working with students for many years now um, who are basically in a kind of indie situation uh, because small teams uh, have different needs from kind of big game teams. And if you look online for Agile and you're like, where do I get started? How do I use Agile in game development? You will find a lot of mysterious jargon about pigs and chickens and scrums. And like, it's just hard to really understand what's going on. So this is intended to be kind of um, the, the the basic intro to um, how to use Agile in a way that actually makes sense for small teams. Uh, and then we'll talk about some tools for accountability and support that's mostly based on the student projects who are always working based on goodwill and not, you know, pay. Uh, and then a couple of tools for um, helping you to manage your processes. Uh, so I'm going to do a lightning uh, discussion of the, the big steps of game production. Uh, I imagine a lot of people in the audience already know these things, but it's good to kind of lay the groundwork. Uh, this is how we usually characterize it. Uh, there's a long period called pre-production in which you're sort of wandering around in the wilderness, developing your ideas, figuring out what is this game that we're making. And the outcome of that, uh, as you go along, you will figure out what your experience goal is, uh, and you will develop some kind of top-level documentation. Uh, in our program, we use something called a game macro, but just something that lays out in a nice um, shorthand form, what are the pieces of this game, uh, like a map, so that you know when you've filled in the whole map. Uh, at the end of pre-pro, you hopefully have something, you should have something called vertical slice. Uh, a vertical slice is a piece of the middle of your game that um, expresses the sort of core experience of playing your game. So it might be from level three, if you have five levels, uh, it's usually not the first few minutes of your game. So it doesn't include things like tutorials and, and figuring out how to introduce mechanics. It's just, this is it. Uh, if somebody were to walk away from your vertical slice, and describe what it is, they would say similar words if they finish playing your game as well. That's the idea. Uh, it is very important that your vertical slice actually capture your experience goal. Uh, if you have a vertical slice that does not capture your experience goal, as Tracy pointed out earlier, it's so important that you would wanna go back and uh, you wouldn't say you're actually hitting that milestone vertical slice until you, it actually does hit at least part of your experience goal. How do you test that? Um, I suggest just asking people an open-ended question. What did that feel like? And if they say words that sound like your experience goal, then you're on the right track, right? They may not say all of your experience goals. Sometimes you need in a story game in particular, you know, you, you might need more game to get to that point, but they should say things that are in the right direction. Uh, they also, the vertical slice also includes something called a beautiful corner, which shows what your final art style looks like uh, and that it's all intended to, as well as uh, actually get something made to be a shakedown of your processes, your pipeline, making sure your team knows how to work together. You can get the assets all the way into the engine, all that kind of mechanical stuff is uh, going. All the plumbing of your team basically is, is good to go. All right, and then you have alpha, which is when you've basically uh, kind of put every building into your city map, but you haven't maybe built all, the, all of them up yet. That's considered the end of major development, even though you might still add a little bit of content, um, some maybe extra mechanics and stuff like that before beta. Uh, once you're in the in after alpha and before and in beta, uh, that's basically when you fix bugs, you add a lot of uh, user feedback in your game, so particles, uh, and you add polish like sounds and more particles. Um, you never really stop adding particles. I'll just I'll just say that. Uh, and then you go into uh, something called you used to call this gold master. It's kind of a I would say a little bit of obsolete term now, so we call it pre-launch. Uh, and that's if you were doing console development or um, mobile development, this is where you would do your uh, acceptance testing and so forth. Okay, so that's the map. Um, and this is the map of kind of the very basic phases of an Agile project. And Agile is used all over software. It's not a game specific thing. And that's actually part of why it's a little hard to uh, adapt it specifically for game projects. Um, but the basic steps can still be done the same way. Uh, you have this massive project kickoff meeting and that's where you have um, you have your core idea and you're like, what are we gonna do to make this game? You create something that is called a backlog. That's a list of essentially features. Uh, you lay out in broad strokes, we're gonna do this and then that. Uh, we're gonna use this art style. We're gonna use that uh, development philosophy. You know, this DI framework or, or whatever tools you think are, are relevant is that's when you start figuring that out. 
Uh, you would set your priorities uh, for each thing that you put into your backlog. You would say, this has really got to happen, or eh, this would be cool if we did it. Uh, and, and then you say, what is going to be in our vertical slice, for example. Then you immediately, you do this once. Uh, I would say once per project is the traditional way. I would actually suggest thinking about doing this once per milestone of treating them each as mini projects, uh, just so that you get that chance to evaluate and make sure that you're all sort of pointed in the same direction. Uh, in a sprint planning meeting, you a, a sprint is a, a period of time. It's a week or two weeks or a month, depending on your team. It's at the point at which you have these check checkpoint meetings and say, did, how much did we get done, right? So they're the opposite of a milestone. A milestone is, did we get the thing done? A check-in is just, how much did we get done? What are we gonna do next? So that's what you do in your sprint planning meeting. You pick out your tasks for the next week or so. You say what are your priorities. You slap some uh, hours estimates on there just in an effort to uh, contain the amount of work that you do. During your uh, sprint, during your next week or so, you might have this thing called a scrum. I'll come back to why that has a question mark. Uh, that's just a kind of daily check-in where you say, okay, I did two hours of work yesterday or whatever, and um, hey, would you please answer my email uh, so that I can become unblocked on my task. That's what Scrum is for. At the end of your sprint, uh, this is a thing that a lot of people skip, but it's possibly the best thing about Agile, in my opinion. Uh, you take five minutes and say, how can we work better together? What are some things? How can we change our folder structure so that our artists don't have to click through 30 folders to put things in the right place? Just any little thing that you can do to make it more pleasant to work together and more efficient. Uh, so the, the thing about using uh, Agile is that you're supposed to adapt it for your teams. So a critical approach is necessary for kind of the non-standard situation where you don't have 40 people working 40 hours a week, getting paid, et cetera. Uh, so you would want to think through why, do, why are we doing each of these parts of the thing, uh, parts of the process and adjust it specifically for your team. These are things that I found helpful for small and part-time teams. First of all, uh, decide how much process you need. Uh, it's possible to err in the direction of too much process because if you ask people to do too much documentation or too many meetings or you know, just generally add too much weight to it, they just won't do it. <laughs> no process is worse than a lightweight one. Uh, for a very small team, you might consider rotating the producer role. The producer is the person who is essentially the project manager and checks who's doing what and did they get it done and, and that sort of thing. Um, again, in a way oriented towards transparency more than um, nagging, but you know, somebody's got to know what's going on basically. And this is a big one. If you're in a part-time situation, uh, when you pick out your tasks for the next week or two, you will want to look at the rest of your life and say, what else is going to happen <laughs> in the next week or two? I can't just automatically say every week of my life, I'm going to have 20 hours available for my game because some weeks are Thanksgiving or some weeks... Uh, a relative has a baby or like things happen, right? So it's good if you can look ahead and see those things and just take on less work that week so that you don't feel um, like you've let your team down. Uh, accountability in a remote context is especially important. Um, and for that reason, I would consider doing a week long sprint instead of a two week sprint um, because that way you just get that much more transparency. You come in after each week and say, hey, here's what's up, here's what I'm doing. This is what I'm gonna do next week. This didn't work for everybody, but it's a thought. Uh, in terms of accountability for remote teams particularly, I'm going to wrap this up as quickly as I can. Um, it is important to give other people on the team permission to follow up with you. Just say up front, hey, you know, there are going to be times when I forget to do something or, or I'm not hitting my, my targets. And I explicitly give you permission to follow up with me because that way they feel less shy about following up with you, right? You're saying it's okay. Send me an email saying, hey, how's it going? What's your thing? You could indeed write an email to yourself and then give it to other people so that they send it to you and you already know that you gave them that permission, right? It just reduces that social friction. Uh, and likewise, in the other direction, give people permission to have setbacks and not quite hit their targets. Things happen, including I'm tired. I'm tired is a thing that happens. Uh, working well together might mean working uh, socially. That means, as you probably have all heard of, you turn on Zoom, turn off the sound and just work, but it creates that feeling of social accountability. Schedule rest for yourselves, uh, find nice things to do for your teammates, send them a card or draw them a flower or those little things really make a big difference in terms of getting through the very long slog that is game development. Uh, and if you find cool stuff, share it. Um, just try to convey excitement so that everybody feels good about working on the team or on the, on the project. 
Uh, for your own sake, it's good to give yourself some low prio tasks that you can turn to if you're feeling exhausted but you still wanna make progress. Uh, just go ahead and schedule those in in each sprint. Uh, and this is a tip I got from my colleague, Peter Brinson. Uh, each time you work, leave something slightly unfinished so that when you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I just need to finish that one thing, right? Like I know exactly what I need to do. I just need to go and like comment out that line of code or whatever, because uh, that just makes it so much easier to start <laughs> your day. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna basically run through these so that they are in the uh, recording. Um, use lightweight tools for lightweight teams. Uh, you don't need Jira, use spreadsheets, they're fine. Trello's fine, Codex is fine. Um, you absolutely do need version control. Uh, Git is what everybody uses. It is not, however, necessarily a, base, a, a great choice specifically for game development, uh, but you can consider a split strategy where your code lives in Git and your assets live on a shared drive or uh, some other um, setup so that you have less um, pressure on your Git repository. Uh, and finally, you will wanna look into Parsecs. Um, Parsec is a, an online testing tool and you can do metrics uh, pretty easily if you just write out to a text file and then ask your tester to send it to you. So you don't need to get into like really elaborate metric systems and using cloud metrics and whatever, just write out a file. And um, that because remote testing is mostly about sending it off to someone and having them play it on their own, those metrics are gonna be really helpful to you. Okay, that was my presentation. And uh, this is my somewhat inactive, but working on it, a uh, professional Twitter handle. I, I really do welcome anybody getting in touch to talk about this further. Thank you.